Um, all right, you know what I want to do? I've been talking a long time, so I'm, I'm going to shoot right through to the examples that I wanted to mention, and then we can we can circle back and and have a look at uh, some questions and some clarifications. The way to do that for me, I think, is to just pick out one last quote. This is in about the fifth session of that um, first seminar, and he says something, well, here is what he says. What does the other become less and truly other to the extent that it takes on a more or less exclusively the function of support? Um, I had really broached the question of who is the other of the analysand? Is it the little other? In other words, the mirror image other, the, the projection of myself that I see in the figure of the analyst? Is it this other or is there another other with a big O? And this distinction between a little other as mirror image, as my counterpart, as my vehicle of projection, um, and another other with a capital O, which in effect designates symbolic activities, the otherness of my speech, where something unknown comes to the fore, uh, a locus of truth in the symbolic utterances and, and enunciations I make. That other, the big O, as locus of truth, as locus of the unconscious, is, is what Lacan is moving to and what he wants us to focus on. So the quote that I just gave you, I can maybe try and make it a little bit more accessible. Why does the other become less and truly other to the extent that it takes on the function of a support? Here's one way of thinking about that rather ambiguous pronouncement. It seems here, one interpretation of what Lacan is saying, is that we as clinicians are at times tempted, perhaps for very good consoling reasons, to be another ego in the room, another human being, a recognizing human being, someone who mirrors and receives and empathizes with what's going on. And yet we could say that there may be some very good ethical reasons to avoid being an ego for the patient's ego. In fact, much of Lacan's early teaching is precisely about this point. Again, we have arrived at a somewhat counterintuitive position. Why would that be a problem? Surely to be received by another ego who supports my ego is precisely what I need as an ego from time to time. Well, there's at least two potential problems here for Lacan. To be a supportive ego for the patient's ego, to be the mirror by which they reflect or have reflected back at them what their ego needs and what they want to have affirmed is problematic. Firstly, you could say that it disrupts the potential of them finding out something new about themselves because it operates rather to console the ego's own image of itself. It makes the realization of subjective truth difficult, if not impossible, because it's fundamentally a defensive posture. It wants to be seen and affirmed in a way that reiterates the status quo of how the ego understands itself. This is a posture which enables resistance. And this also, I think, starts to help us when we think about why does he align resistance and ego so strongly. Secondly, the clinical position of situating oneself as the recognizing, affirming human ego that the patient can see themselves in is a position which dissipates or dilutes the subject's agency as a subject. It allows them to assume a reliance of sorts on an intersubjective relation to the figure of the analyst. So this is a kind of interesting point. It seems to turn upside down some of our everyday commonplace assumptions of what would be helpful, of what would be ethical for the position of the analyst working in a relational capacity or working as an ego to affirm the ego of, um, of a client. So here are the two examples. And then after that, we, we, can, we can hopefully break um, for some discussion. So they're both personal examples. Um, and the first one is of a breakdown of grief in a session. So I was in analysis for about seven years, and I didn't, I didn't do a lot of um, uh, explicit crying. <laughs> I can see you looking and saying, I don't lie to us, Jake. We can tell. Anyway, so there was, there was one particularly very emotional session. And um, for whatever reason, I, I, I hadn't done this a lot. But there was one session, and it, and it involves a departure and saying bye to my mom and thinking I may not see her again. Anyway, so I related this and, and, and suddenly, you know, the emotion took on a different level and, and I was very tearful. And um, <clears throat> I wondered what the analyst was going to do. And uh, I thought, well, is this going to be the moment when I hear this must be very difficult for you? 
uh, but it wasn't. And I suppose in that moment, what I started to realize that so many of the routine comments that I would offer clinically can so easily sound condescending. That must be difficult for you, so on and so forth. And I also got a sense there that empathy is often potentially a bad strategy, even an unethical strategy in that situation. Not only because you, as the analyst with the person who's in tears there, don't know what the other is going through, but because pretending to or trying to can risk being somewhat patronizing. It risks, I think, making a false gesture. Now, maybe there's a lot of clinicians out there who are much more talented than me and, and can do that kind of thing. But all I know in that situation, which you could say was maybe the most powerful emotional session I had in the course of seven years, all I got was a tissue box pushed across the floor to me. Okay, so that was a gesture. But there was no, um, there was no sense of um, a solidarity. There was no sense of, no psychologically feigned sense of empathy. I mean, we could argue about what does empathy mean there? And maybe the empathy is in the structure rather than in, in, in the words or how they were professed. But all I know is that by the time I got to the door and the door was closed behind me, it felt like, yes, there was grief. There was, there was a lot of pain there, but it, that it was mine and it remained mine. And it was better that way. Um, it made me think that honoring the other's pain or in this respect, my pain could be about not trying to empathize, about not him trying to fully understand it, about witnessing, yes, and this is a phrase that Lacan starts to use, the witnessing is crucial, witnessing the speech, witnessing what is said, but not a gesture of my ego feels for your ego. So I got the tissue box ushered along towards me on the floor, no consolation, um, and I knew then, just to reiterate, both that my grief was my grief, and that any gesture of sympathy would have been not just potentially false, but also potentially humiliating. Because I knew that I wanted to come back, but I wanted to go back to that room without feeling that someone had been nice to me. Because if someone had been nice to me there, it would have meant that I would have to feel the need to reciprocate, to acknowledge their kindness in some way, to treat the analyst as a good person and potentially act accordingly. It would also presumably mean that my ability to transfer a whole series of aggressive, whatever other material that needed to get transferred would have been slightly more circumscribed if now the analyst was the nice caring person who taken care of me. So in a weird way, I know it's an odd example, there was something agentic about the fact that the analyst did not do anything empathic in that moment. And so I suppose we hit upon an ethical paradox. Perhaps the best way of witnessing the other is not to try to assimilate them to my ego, to what I can understand, and to be in a position of the benevolent listener or the moral support figure, but to witness them precisely in their otherness. That is, in how they exceed the parameters of what I can grasp with my ego, and how they exceed my own understanding of the how and the what of my empathy. What is other in them, what represents what I cannot fathom, understand, is in this sense more ethical than trying to connect on an ego to ego level. Okay, again, a counterintuitive argument, but you could argue then that what's more ethical in that situation is to be aware of what in the other exceeds what I can empathize with and what exceeds what I'm able to understand. Because as soon as I start trying to understand and empathize, I'm essentially assimilating them into the conceptual parameters of how I understand the world and my ego. Okay, second example. Um, and this might help because we're working with the South African group, so people may be able to understand it better than others. Um, another moment in, in, in therapy for me in analysis came after about maybe being in analysis for, for three years. And I suppose my symptom <laughs> was whiteness. So I had this really neurotic series of symptoms, and I, I just hated being seen as a white South African. And I thought that was how I was being seen the whole time. And there was some truth to it because, you know, I was at a university, which was, you know, a pretty progressive place. But you could say it was presumably more my issue than the issue of people around me. But it was a very pressing uh, thing. And, it, and there were lots of little actings out and, and situations that are too embarrassing to enumerate. But all I can say is there was a problem for me to be a white South African. And um, it was kind of like I needed to try and prove to all who would listen to all who would read what I wanted to write, my research program, everything was kind of trying to be not a bad white South African racist subject. 
and um, or a South African who abandoned his country, all of this stuff, you know, there were lots and lots of things. So it went on for a long time. And then in one session, I still don't know exactly what happened, but um, I was talking and I said, you know what? I am a white South African. The analyst got up and opened the door and I was a bit you know, surprised by that. It's a typical Lacanian scansion of the session, you know, an abrupt ending. And something about that, I left and something shifted. And it, from that point, I'd heard myself say it in a way that it had been witnessed. I heard myself say it in a way that it got heard. Not that must be difficult for you, whatever. It, he, didn't even, he didn't even remark upon it, but my words impacted back on me. And yeah, you know, maybe it's still a complicated thing, um, what I take to be my relationship to my own whiteness, but it stopped being a symptom. It, it's it's not, and we could tell because I'm not embarrassed and, and blushing hugely, which I normally do in these things. Um, and I don't know what changed, but it wasn't, remember earlier comments, sometimes it's not about understanding, but it's about the impact of speech itself. And I think in that moment, there was something of a realization, which somehow, some it shifted. It shifted something. Okay, I got a lot more ideas, a lot more thoughts, but I think by now it might be useful to, to break and get some uh, comments, questions, and, and some discussion. Sorry, just the, the last thing to say, I should have mentioned this right at the beginning. The, the, the topic of the talk was why Lacan, why now, why Seminar 1? And I think for me, the answers to those questions would be, Lacan's going to help us think about our clinical vocabulary, our concepts, our technique, he will help, we don't have to all be card carrying Lacanians by the end of this, but he will help interrogate and question some of our commonplace assumptions of how to do clinical work, and also some ethical questions, precisely like how to position myself relative to the other. Those are the reasons for me why I think some of these um, ideas are useful, and, um, and I hope some of those examples that I've used at the end may have, may have tried to, to make that point. Thanks. Yeah, very, very good uh, question. So. Two basic reference points. You could say that if the analyst is going to refer to some material, perhaps in a demonstrative capacity, do they do that by saying, oh, I, you're irritated with me by referring to things in the here and now, by referring to themselves, referring to the relationship? You could say if that's happening, that for Lacan would still be in the remit within the parameters of a two-person psychology. For him, what's much more important is to refer to what the subject has said in their speech. So the slip to the tongue, the ambiguities, the possible ambivalences, the, the mixed metaphors, the odd idioms, the speech products of what's going on. And the reason your, your question is apt is that as that seminar continues and into seminar two, Lacan is going to increasingly involve this concept of the big other, with the capital O. And the big other is basically this idea that whenever you and I are, are, are having a, a speech interaction, there must by definition be a third listening reference point. That's the big other. Now, Lacan means multiple things by it, but essentially to answer your question, the move that the analyst makes is not to say, oh, this is you interpreting me or you projecting this onto me. In other words, it's not to point back to themselves or what's happening in the room, but to see what the symbolic productions of the person themselves are. And here the big other could also be understood as language, as their symbolic utterances. And why that's so important is because language is other in a sense that you can end up saying much more than you thought you would when you start speaking. And you can make a whole series of unintended meanings and, and slippages and so on and so forth. So that's symbolic transference. The analyst there is not using themselves simply as the, the vessel of projections that are being or the receptacle of those projections, but is pointing to what the person has just said that may have another meaning. And the analyst is not the person who would, you know, as the master or the authority know what that means. They simply have to underline the fact that there's another possible meaning that's going on there. So the symbolic transference is about the analyst trying to step outside of the position of being the sole receptacle of transferences and projections and trying to, to facilitate the work of the analysand doing their own analysis of what they thought their dreams meant, of their own analysis of why they made that funny slip when they came in, of their own analysis of why they're always 15 minutes exactly late when they come into the session. 